more at, uh, in a physical form, the campus on your beautiful, beautiful university. So here I would uh, be talking about a work, some works I've been doing with many, many physicists uh, over the past 10, 15 years. So I'll share my screen now. I hope that my screen is now. Uh, yes. Well, is that the case? Yes, it's fine. Perfect. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to talk about the work here, which is, uh, let me just change my uh, system so I can uh, perhaps. Um, okay, so let me use my, uh, do you see the laser pointer to here? Yes, yes, it looks fine. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to talk about string landscape on the swampland. Quantum field theories without gravity included are well understood. Um, they, they beautifully describe the interaction of all elementary particles we know. And we know what constitutes the consistent quantum field theory without gravity included. To include gravity, that is Einstein's theory, and describe it in a quantum, uh, describe it quantum mechanically, we need to couple the quantum field theory to gravity. What that means is that we take the space time to be a fluctuating uh, metric, we have a fluctuating metric. So in other words, we promote a metric G to dynamical field and introduce the action, the curvature term, the Einstein Hilbert term. And then we integrate over both the matter, the gauge fields and the metric with an action which we have. So this is the basic idea of coupling any quantum field theory to gravity. So uh, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that this approach does not work. The infinities appearing in the Feynman diagrams are incurable. And so a conventional approach to quantizing gravity does not work as Feynman discovered already in 1960s. The most natural conclusion from this would have been gravity cannot be coupled to quantum fields consistently and should always be viewed only as a background. You don't have a dynamical graviton. But that is not acceptable because we know in the universe we live in, we do have gravitational forces. So, and we of course have quantum mechanics. So therefore we have to have both dynamical gravity and quantum mechanics. Okay, so what is the resolution? String theory offers a resolution of this problem by replacing elementary point particles by extended one dimensional strings. And this somehow leads to consistent quantum theories of gravity. The Feynman diagrams given the word lines are replaced by word sheets. And you have this, uh, this picture where you have these diagrams replaced by word, di word sheet diagrams. And the infinities that you would naively get in the Feynman diagrams when you have graviton exchanges is somehow re uh, resolved due to the fact that the string has a particular size and that size is key in resolving the inconsistencies of, of these quantum gravitational aspects of these scattering amplitudes. So things all look good. But can we get every consistent quantum field theory in four dimensions in this way, coupled to gravity from string theory? Well, string, string theory comes with six extra dimension and these dimensions should be viewed as compact tiny spaces, which have thus far avoided detection. So many solutions exist to what these extra six dimensions look like based on finding solutions to string theory. Here is a caricature of them. And you know you can think about the extended space as the space we live in as this yellow uh, grid I've drawn here and the tiny compact space at each point being the same typically, not different here. Here is shown differently, but typically we're taking the same as the compactification of string theory from 10 to six. And depending on what space we take, for example, here I'm taking that space to be a torus of some dimension, uh, we can consider different excitations of string or wrapping them around different cycles of this extra dimensional space. And as far as the space time that we live in, the extended space time, the three plus one dimensional space time, which I'm here denoting by this blue sheet here, each one of those excitations corresponds to a particle. And so there are different states of particle as viewed from our perspective, but they all correspond to string, perhaps wound one way or the other or oscillating one way or the other. Depending on what these extra six dimensional spaces are, we get different physics in four dimension. For example, one particular 
uh, geometry of six dimensions might lead to the gate symmetry related to a group SU4. And it might have two generations of matter in it. Another choice of a six dimensional compact space will give you a totally different group, SU3 times SU5, maybe with this different matter representations. So the question arises is if I'm interested in arbitrary gate symmetry with arbitrary matter content, can I obtain it by choosing some compactification of string theory. It seems from what we have learned in string theory that the answer for this is no. We cannot get arbitrary quantum field theories. Indeed, we seem to obtain only a finite number of quantum field theories from string theory. A finite number when the number of quantum field theories are infinitely many consistent ones. For example, consider a theory, a quantum field theory with a maximal number of supersymmetries, which uh, is a symmetry between bosons and fermions, and the maximal number of supersymmetries is four in four dimensions. So, so we consider n equals to four supersymmetry in four dimensions. The theory with such a high supersymmetry is completely specified once you say what is the gauge group. So you choose the gauge group and you're you are basically defined the theory. It turns out that in string theory, you can never get any gauge group whose rank is bigger than 23. So the rank is always less than 23. And the gate symmetry, for example, if it's SUM, the M bigger than 23 seems not to arise in string theory. So therefore, from a string theory perspective, we conclude that this gauge symmetry SUM with M bigger than 23 with N equal to four supersymmetry coupled to gravity in four dimension is inconsistent. At least that's what the string theory cannot give it to you. So the quantum field theories from string theory form a measure zero of consistent quantum field theories. And it appears therefore that Feynman was almost right. A generic consistent quantum field theory, if you take a typical one, it cannot be consistently coupled to gravity. So essentially every quantum field theory that you randomly pick even though it by itself is consistent, once you couple it to gravity dynamically, it becomes inconsistent. This raises two questions. The first question is, does the fact that most quantum field theories do not arise in string theory, a deficiency of string theory, or a general conclusion about consistency requirements for coupling to quantum gravity? It might be that, you know, we just have a limited, uh, limitations due to the looking for these solutions within string theory. Maybe, maybe there's something bigger that can have all possible quantum field theories, not just the limited one we're getting in string theory. Evidence is emerging that this is not a deficiency of string theory, but subtle reasons for consistency of quantum gravity. Connections with basic facts of quantum gravity, such as unitarity and quantum consistency of black holes point in this direction. So I will try to explain some of these criteria and what, what, why are they, how they are related to some other basic facts about black holes and other things that we have learned. I have to emphasize, when I say some theory is, quantum field theory is problematic with gravity, it doesn't mean that that quantum field theory by itself is bad. As I mentioned, the N equal to four supersymmetric theories are perfectly fine quantum field theories in four dimension. In fact, not only they are perfectly fine for any gauge group, they are the best quantum field theories in the sense that the theory is finite. They don't even have any divergences whatsoever in the Feynman diagrams. This theory is a finite theory. So therefore, this is quite surprising that if you take one of these nice quantum field theories, which are finite, as soon as you include gravity, gravity as a dynamical field added to the mix, it destroys it if the rank of the gauge group is bigger than 23. The second question is, what criteria distinguishes a good quantum field theory, which is what we call as part of the string landscape, from bad ones? Bad in the sense that they belong to swampland, which means they do not arise in quantum gravity theories. The, the, the program to, to delineate these criteria is called the swampland program. So we, we, we imagine that we have choices of string compactification and they give you some specific quantum field theories, and, but not all of them. So in general, if you look at the space of all quantum field theories as this green space here, the spaces that we seem to get, the quantum field theories that we seem to get in quantum gravity in the low energy limit seems to be a very, very special 
jewels kind of subset in this vast space of quantum field theories. And hopefully, of course, standard model is one of them, the theory which, which the world that we live in. And the rest of them are swampland. So the landscape is much smaller and we have this vast space of inconsistent quantum field theories once you couple them to quantum gravity. So my aim here today is to explain some of these requirements for a quantum field theory to, be, to not be in the swampland, to be in the landscape. In other words, what is a good quantum field theory that can be coupled to, to the quantum gravity dynamically with no problems? So I'm going to only talk about seven such properties, even though there are many more properties discovered. And this is based on the work of many different physicists. By no means, this is the work only of myself. So, so I'm not going to give references, but I'm just going to try to explain some of the basic ideas. And in fact, some of them even predate string theory. The first criteria that there is no global symmetries was proposed even before the advent of string theory. So the idea that in any theory of quantum gravity, any constant theory of gravity, you cannot have a symmetry, which is no global symmetry exists. Every, every symmetry you start with, any globally conserved charge that you start with is, gets broken due to quantum gravity effects. The second thing I'm gonna discuss is uniqueness of quantum gravity. This is related to what I'm gonna call cobordism conjecture. The third, criteria is that all gate charges appear in the spectrum. So even though you don't have global symmetries, you can have gate symmetries. In fact, the only symmetries you can have are gate symmetries. And gate symmetries typically give you charge. You can have charged objects. Uh, a consistent quantum gravity demands that all charges that can arise do arise. Everything is forced on you. So all charges are in the spectrum. This is a completeness criteria of quantum gravity. The range of scalar fields typically is infinite in quantum field theory for a consistent effective field theory. But in string theory, you get a finite effective range for fields. This is called, this is related to what's basically the discovery of duality symmetries in string theory. So this is called either the distance conjecture or the duality conjecture that I will mention. A consistent quantum theory of gravity always admits light higher dimensional objects as in string theory. Gravity is always the weakest force. This is called the weak gravity conjecture. Gravitational force is always the, among, is, is among the various forces that it arises in a the given theory is always the weakest one. And finally, I will talk about restrictions that a consistent quantum theory of gravity seems to place on the structure of the potential, which are positive. And this will have some, uh, and also it's critical points, and this will have some cosmological implications. This is related to the so-called Visitor conjectures. Before I start describing these uh, criteria, for, perhaps it's best if I review some basic facts about, uh, about black holes. So consider a black hole of a fixed charge Q and a mass M. You think about this M to be much bigger than the Planck mass, it's a big mass, so it's a big mass black hole. Then as long as the mass, and I'm, I'm denoting here the mass in Planck units, as long as the mass is bigger than the charge, there is a, you can get a black consistent solution of Einstein's equation. Uh, and this is called a charged black hole. There's an extreme case of this charged black hole, which M equals to Q, Q, and this is called the extreme of black hole. But M cannot be less than Q. You don't, you don't get a consistent solution to Einstein's equation for M less than Q. So, you only have m bigger than or equal to q. As was discovered by Bekenstein and Hawking in, in the mid 1970s, black holes have thermodynamical properties. In particular, they carry an entropy. A black hole denotes an entity, a collection of possible microscopic states suggest, uh, suggested by the Bekenstein and Hawking computation with an entropy which is very big, it goes like area of this macroscopic black hole computed in Planck units divided by four. So it's a huge entropy. Okay, so this is, this is all I wanted to say about some basic properties of black holes. Uh, and we will describe some of the other ones as I go along. 
So the first criteria I want to talk about in the swamp uh, for the theory to be in the landscape and not in the swampland is that there are no global symmetries. There are no conserved charges uh, in the quantum theory of gravity, which are global. So suppose you have a conserved global charge denoted here by small q. And suppose you throw it inside a black hole. Once you throw this charge inside the black hole, since it's not a gauge force, there will be no electrical field or no, no imprint of that charge. The no hair theorems of black hole tell you that there is no impact of anything you throw in other than its mass, charge, and angular momentum. And therefore, you won't see any imprint of this particle thrown in. So you throw it in. And once you throw it in, we know that according to Bekenstein and Hawking, the black hole is going to evaporate. In fact, this is the Hawking radiation. And so once it evaporates, it gets smaller and smaller. But as it's evaporating, since there is no electric field outside, there's no, there's no particular uh, asymmetry between Q and minus Q for the emission, you get equal amount of Q and minus Q particles coming out. And therefore, you get a neutral emission. And so therefore, when you evaporate completely, you end up with, with no charge at all. And so you have violated the charge. So the charge that you threw in got disappeared through this process of, cre of, a, of a black hole evaporation. So this just gives you an example of why you cannot have a global symmetry in a consistent theory of quantum gravity once you take into account the existence of black holes in this theory. But what about a charged black hole? Yeah, so I'm, a charged black hole is perfectly fine. Charged black hole is a charge with respect to a gate symmetry. That's so right. here I was talking about global symmetry. That's right. Global symmetry and gauge symmetry are distinguished in the sense that global symmetry has no electrical field emanating from it. Charged black hole have electrical field emanating from it. So when a charged black hole evaporates, you get asymmetric emission of charged states because the electrical field will give you an asymmetric emission. The existence of the electrical field outside the black hole preferably, preferentially gives you emission of one charge versus the other. So you don't get any charge violation in that case. Is that clear? Yes, yeah, stupid question, sorry. No, no, it wasn't, it was a good question, thank you. So the second question is uniqueness of quantum gravity. So a generalization of a no global symmetries conjecture is that any consistent quantum, field, quantum gravity can be deformed to any other through a finite action physical process. So let me explain it first physically, what this statement means. Suppose somebody says, you know what? Our universe is just one quantum gravity. You know, it has SU three times SU two cross U one and so forth. But you know, I think there's another consistent quantum gravity with, with a gauge force SU hundred or whatever, and with a very different matter structure. Is there any way to access this other quantum gravity? And the answer is yes, that any consistent quantum gravity is accessible from our universe. And all you have to do is that you can create a bubble, a finite bubble with finite action, with finite energy of the, with the finite energy process, which provides you a, inside this bubble, this other universe. So in other words, all the quantum gravities are connected in this sense. You, there's nothing which distinguishes them. This is a generalization of the no global symmetries. In other words, you cannot tag our universe saying, you know what, our universe has charge plus one and the other one has charge minus three and so on. You cannot go from one to the other. There is no conserved thing which distinguishes our quantum gravity from any other. So any consistent quantum gravity is accessible and there's no preventing of one to go to, from one to the other. And this is related to the uniqueness of quantum gravity. There's only one quantum gravity. In the context of string theory, the way this manifests itself is the following. If you start compactifying the theory on some compact six dimensional space, let me call it M, and somebody says, no, no, I don't like your space. I want another space. And that's another compact, a different looking shape, compact space. It turns out that there's always a way to interpolate from one to the other by finite action process. If you think about moving in time to go from one to the other, you can deform one to the other, possibly making the manifold singular and all that, but with finite action. So physically it's allowed. And so therefore there is no barrier in going from one to the other. So as we said, there is no conserved global symmetries, but there are conserved gauge symmetries. So, so if you consider gauge symmetries, all charges should appear in the spectrum. Suppose we have a U1 gauge symmetry, like in our universe, electromagnetism. 
all integral charges Q are in principle allowed to exist. Are there such states in the theory for all charges? Does the quantum gravity necessarily have to have all these charges? Well, without gravity a priori, there is no reason for this to be the case. For example, we can have a pure U1 Maxwell theory with no charge state at all. With gravity, the story changes. And let me explain why. Again, consider a black hole of mass M and charge Q, uh, which, which has some event horizon. As, as I said, there is the entropy associated with the black hole. The number of states goes like exponential of the area of the event horizon in Planck units divided by four. Now, since, there is, since for every m bigger than or equal to q, there is such a black hole, that means there are states, namely this black hole itself, of subcharge q as long as q is sufficiently big. However, you can take a black hole of charge mass, a mass and charge q and consider another black hole with charge q plus one. Take one with charge q plus one and char another one with charge minus q and put them and collide them with each other. By charge conservation, you get the net charge one. And therefore you can get any charge one and two and three in this way. And so therefore all the charges should appear in your theory. So you cannot avoid having charges in this theory. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about fourth criteria, the fact that the range of the fields for scalar fields is finite. Consider a scalar fields phi Without gravity, we usually have no restriction on its range. Usually say you can have a, for example, scalar real scalar field going from minus infinity to plus infinity. However, with gravity, it seems that the range of the field for a given effective theory, effective theory description cannot be any bigger than the Planck scale. So if you, if you use Planck units, the range of the field is of order one in Planck units. What I mean by that is that if you try to go beyond this range, you can, but what happens is that the effective theory breaks down. You get modified, you have to modify your theory. So the effective theory you, you, you have is only a finite range of validity. And as soon as you go to far away regimes, it becomes inconsistent. So <clears throat> let, me this, let me explain this a little bit in pictures. Typically in string theory, we get not just one real scalar, but many scalars which have to do with the shape or the size of these extra dimensions, extra, extra manifolds. So you get a space of phi's, not just one phi or a manifold of these phi's. So you get some kind of a shape like this, which we call the phi space or a marginalized space. The kinetic term for these scalar fields is something like grad phi squared with some, some mixing between them, which is a function of phi. And this can be viewed as a metric on this phi space, gij of phi. It gives you a metric on the field space. Now, the statement that is that what I was saying is that if you go beyond order one using, using this metric as a way to measure distances on the field space, you find that your effective description of your theory breaks down. And in particular, if you go too far away in field space, large, large values of phi, you end up getting mass light tower of states. So as phi goes to infinity, you get a tower of states whose mass go down exponentially with phi. So for large phi, you get a, a, an infinite tower of light states. And this light tower of states give you a dual description of the theory. So this is in a sense, the reason that uh, this, is what, this is sometimes called the duality conjecture. The duality conjecture or the distance conjecture is the statement that if you go far distance in the field space, you get a, always a dual description. So within a given description, you only have a finite range of validity for the phi. This is quite remarkable, this fact. It's very hard to explain why it's the case. We just know this is the case. So I don't have a good black hole explanation of this, but we have seen in any example of string theory, and this is one of the basic cornerstones of modern developments in the string theory in the past 20, 30 years, is precisely the, the appreciation of the, of the fact that there are always dualities arise in this way. That if you go to far enough distance, you get light states emerging out of nowhere. A potential application of the distance conjecture is that the cosmological constant itself should be viewed as 
expectation value of a field. In fact, in string theory, we don't have any fundamental constants. Every field is going to be given every, every constant in your action should actually be viewed better as an expectation value of some field. If you properly normalize, write the, for example, the cosmological constant in our universe, it turns out the correct normalized field is exponential of a scalar field phi. So therefore, if we say the cosmological constant is about 10 to the, uh, is about 10 to the minus 120 in Planck units, that means phi is around 300. So 300 is quite big in Planck units. So you could say that from what I just said, you might expect that you get a tower of light states with mass of the order of e to the minus uh, some constant times phi. Well, that constant is order one. In other words, you expect the mass to go like some power of lambda to the power of a, where a is some order one number. So in other words, we expect from this perspective that you should get elementary particles whose scale do not go like lambda, but some powers of lambda and the powers could be different powers depending on which tower you have. It is quite amusing that you know, the mass of the neutrino is nicely related to the cosmological constant. It goes like lambda to the one quarter approximately, and this is an interesting relation. So you see here, this is suggesting that the fact that the cosmological constant, which is ultimately related to the dark energy, could be ultimately related to elementary particle physics by these kind of reasonings. So, so this tower of states, of light states that you get when you go way out in field space, even though the field phi is a scalar field, the states you get are, can be fermions. Yes, correct. The fields can be fermions, they can have higher spin, all that. I see, okay, thank you. So this is just, in other words, what that means is that this phi couples to those fields like a Yukawa coupling, for example. And so as your, as your field goes to infinity, somehow their mass goes down, like e to the minus phi times psi bar psi, for example. So the next criteria I want to mention is um, is the um, is what's called the the condition that every quantum gravity involves extended objects. So so you always get extended objects in a constant theory of quantum gravity, and for example in string theory you have extended object. It's one dimensional string. In M theory you get membranes, two dimensional objects. In other words, so. This actually is related to the previous thing I was telling you about, at least heuristically. In other words, just the previous statement that I was making, um, let me just go back. Um, so here I was saying that you have, you, whenever you go in large and field, field space, you get light tower of states. I'm going to derive just from this fact, just from this fact, I'm going to derive the fact that in any quantum theory of gravity, you must have higher dimensional objects. So the higher dimensionality of the theory is consequence of this principle, that whenever you go far in field space, you should get light states. So how does that come about is the following. Suppose you take your quantum gravity and you compactify it on a circle of some radius r. You go one lower dimensional theory. So well, the radius of the theory is a dynamical degree of freedom in quantum gravity. And so therefore you should view this radius as a dynamical field in the lower dimensional theory. And once you can properly normalize it, you find that you have to write R as e to the phi with a Lagrangian, which becomes one half grad phi squared. So you get an extra field phi, which is the radius of this extra circle that you compactify. So now let's consider the limit where this phi is large. I was telling you that if you go to the large values of the phi, you should get light states. So what does a large value of phi mean? The large value of phi means r is going to infinity. So if you get the radius going bigger and bigger, what's gonna happen from the perspective of this lower dimensional theory is that you get light gravitational modes corresponding to the momentum modes of the graviton going around the circle. So if the circle becomes large, their, their energy goes like one over r or proportional to one over r and therefore they go to zero. So you get the tower of what we call the Kaluza Klein tower which are becoming light. So that's an example of what happens if phi goes to infinity of this light tower. But then you can also say, what about phi goes to minus infinity? So phi goes to plus infinity gives you r much, much bigger than one and the energy goes down, but we can also go the other way. Namely, we can go phi much, much less than zero. If you go to phi much, much less than zero, that corresponds to r going to zero because r is e to the phi. 
And so that means the radius is shrinking to nothing. If the radius is shrinking to very, very small radius, and if you had the particle theory, then what happens is that all the modes which are not zero momentum modes around the circle freeze out because all the other momentum modes which you have your Fourier modes around the circle becomes highly energetic and therefore they get mass, mass frozen out because of their mass. So if you were talking about particle theory, you don't get any light tower of states. Therefore the theory will not, so this, if, if the, in other words, if the quantum gravity is only a theory of particles, then as phi goes to minus infinity, there would be no light tower of states. And that's inconsistent with what I was telling you about. I was telling you that as you go to phi to any large values of phi in absolute value, you should get light tower of states. The only way this can be is that if you have extended objects which feel the global topology of the space, for example, if you have a string, you can have a string wrapped around the cycle of the circle. And as the circle shrinks, so does the mass of the string wrapped around the circle because the mass of the wrapped string is the tension times the radius. So as the radius goes to zero size, you get the light state. Or if you have a membrane, you can have one of the sides of the membrane wrapped around the circle. So in, in other words, this shows that if you're expecting to get the light state by circle going to zero size, you better have an extended object. Point particles won't do. So, and this is the only natural mechanism for this, namely having extended strings, uh, object or strings. So this gives you the basic picture of how these, connect, how these principles connect with one another. The next criteria I wanna talk about is, is what's called the weak gravity conjecture. That is, gravity is the weakest force. Well, in our universe, gravity is the weakest, weakest force, but it also in string theory compactification, it has been observed that no matter what, what extra space you take, what, whatever you take as a six dimensional compact tiny space, you always find particles whenever you get electric charged particles and uh, whenever you have, uh, when you compute their mass, you always find that their electric repulsion is stronger than gravitational attraction. So, so for example, if I'm here drawing a particle between uh, two, two charge, same particle of a given charge, that gravitational attraction goes like m squared over r squared and the electric repulsion goes like e squared over r squared, m is always less than e where I'm here measuring m in Planck units. So I've absorbed the Newton constant into the, the definition of what I mean by mass. In our universe, this is true of course, namely the elementary charged states, the lightest one being electron, has mass in Planck units 10 to the minus 23 and electric charge 10 to the minus one. And indeed electrons mass is much, much less than its electric charge. That's, that's why in our universe, gravity is in fact the weakest force. This is an illustration of that statement. What's the explanation of this? Well, the explanation is again related to black holes and its evaporation. Consider an extremal black hole. Extremal black hole is a case where the mass is equal to the charge. So we take a huge black hole with a huge mass and a huge charge Q and they are balanced, M equals to Q. Now, as I said, uh, the black holes evaporate and as they evaporate, so they, the, the charge of the black hole goes down by, evapor by emitting tiny elementary particles of charge Q, small Q and mass small m. So the big mass and the big charge go down by m minus m and the q minus q. But the remaining black hole should satisfy the property for a consistent black hole for which as I had already told you the mass, the net mass should be bigger than or equal to the charge. But you started with the mass equal to the charge, the capital M was equal to the charge. And therefore, if you put these together, you find that the small m, instead of being bigger than q is actually less than q. So the elementary particle mass should be less than the charge such that the big black hole can decay. So you should have elementary particles in your theory such that their mass is less than or equal to charge. The extremal case that M equals to Q can also occur for supersymmetric cases. And these are called the BPS states. So these are exceptional cases, but typically mass is less than Q. So this is again, a black hole explanation of the weak gravity conjecture. So this is an interesting prediction because what we are saying is that this fact that the mass of the electron is 10 to the minus 23 is less than 10 to the minus one 
is a prediction of string theory. It's not just the fact that in our universe, but actually a prediction. Well, it's a weak prediction, like 10 to the minus 23, but still it could have gone the other way. But actually there's something stronger we can say. You see, there are further evidences for weak gravity conjecture that I will first say, and then I come back to the next point. Um, if you consider pure Maxwell theory coupled to gravity, so that means take a U1 electromagnetism, but suppose we lived in a universe which had no electric charge object, just takes Maxwell theory and graviton. Then what, what you find is that you can find the configurations of gravity and electric field that when the electrical field becomes strong, you develop naked singularity by the, you develop singularity, which is, which is not behind an event horizon. And these are called uh, naked singularities. Whenever you develop a singularity, which is not inside an event horizon, which can be viewed from infinity, from asymptotic infinity, these are called naked singularities. So uh, Penrose had conjectured that these cannot happen in, in quantum gravity theories or in gravity theories. And so here you get a contradiction that if you take pure Maxwell and Einstein theory, you seem to get naked singularities. Well, it turns out that the weak gravity conjecture leads to avoiding it in a very, very uh, interesting way. First of all, pure Maxwell theory and Einstein gravity cannot be consistent as I already told you. You must have charged states. Okay. In other words, the completeness of spectrum means there must be elementary charged states. The weak gravity conjecture also implies that these charged states cannot be too heavy because the mass is less than or equal to charge for some of these elementary states. Okay, so then you go back to try to create these naked singularities by electrical fields. It turns out as soon as you make the electrical field become large enough for you to create the singularities, because you have light states with mass less than charge, these electrical field induce creation of particles of light mass, which are charged, and they screen the electrical field, get rid of singularity. So as soon as you try to create singularity, these elementary particles screen it away. So this is actually uh, cons restores uh, the weak gravity, uh, restores the uh, cosmic censorship that naked singularities are hidden behind the horizon. You see, we didn't put this by hand, but somehow properties of string theory seem to know about these facts in these beautiful ways. Another application of the weak gravity con conjecture to our universe is the following. We live in a universe for which the, there's a dark energy and the dark energy basically means that uh, we live in a space which is approximately the sitter space. Uh, when you solve Einstein's equation with positive energy, it's exponentially expanding and this space is called the de Sitter space. Now, when I was telling you about the evaporation of the black holes, I gave you a condition for mass less than equal to charge, which was the weak gravity conjecture. It relates to small black holes. Of course, these could be galactic sized black holes, but they are still small. By, by small and large, I mean compared to the whole size of the whole universe. So you can imagine in our universe, a black hole as big as the entire universe and, and ask what happens, what is the condition for that to decay? And suppose worse than that, you take a mass that big with that net charge, a huge extreme of black hole, the whole size of the universe, let's imagine that. But for the condition for that to, to evaporate actually turns out to give you an inequality that the mass of these charged particles has a lower bound given by the charge to the one half times the lambda to the one quarter. So if you apply this to the elect, to the, our universe you and you put in the value of the dark energy for our universe and the charge, you find that there must be elementary charged particles whose mass is between 10 to the minus 31 and 10 to the minus one. An electron being 10 to the minus 23 fits in that window. Well, this is slightly better than the previous prediction. It's, it's still not, not something I'm terribly proud of because the range is still big, but still you're beginning to see now some specific quantitative predictions from string theory, which gives you some predictions for how the elementary particles should, see, should fit and they lo and behold fit with what we have observed in the universe. It is tantalizing the uh, uh, fa tantalizing fact that the mass of the neutrino which is close to lambda to one quarter seems to be saturating the lower, the left-hand side of this, if you ignore this Q. Of course, the neutrino does not have electric charge, so I cannot quite apply it to a neutrino, but perhaps thinking about the electroweak forces and viewing that, maybe there's a way to understand the neutrino bias as saturating the lower bound here. 
it'll be quite interesting to try to see whether these can be explained that way. So the, the, the last set of restrictions that I want to talk about, which turn out to be quite, quite interesting for phenomenology, are restrictions related to the critical points of the potentials when the potential is positive. And also how flat a potential can get. So consider a potential which is positive and we ask whether or not you can have a flat potential. Now, why is that important? Well, it turns out that this is an important question for early cosmology in the context of inflation models. In the inflation models, we consider a potential uh, which is, uh, which is positive and relatively flat for a large range of phi. And also they are interesting for late cosmology uh, in the context of dark energy, because the natural way to get the dark energy is the minimum of the potential in our universe could be positive value lambda, which is small, some positive small value. So the basic model here for both for early universe and the late universe includes a requirement of understanding better how the positive potential theories arise in string theory, whether we know much about those. It turns out that this is a difficult problem for string theory. The reason is that if you consider a situation where the potential is positive, supersymmetry, the symmetry between the bosons and fermions, which typically arises in high energies in string theory, must be broken. So we are in a situation where we have a broken supersymmetry. And when supersymmetry gets broken, a lot of the analytic tools that we have in the context of string theory become unmanageable. So therefore things become much more difficult and you have to describe strong coupling limits of string theory and we do not know how to handle those. So we do not have a good handle, I would say, on the general question about what we know about theory, questions of this type that I'm raising here. But we do know some things and I want to actually review what we do know. Consider the scalar fields that I was telling you about. There's a geometry in this scalar field space so we are interested in the potential as a function of these scalar fields. So what do we know about them? Well, as I told you, if you go to far enough distances in the field space, you always get a dual description for the theory, like these little tubes that I'm drawing here. On these corners, that these tubes that I'm drawing here, it turns out that the theory has a weakly coupled description. So for these regions, far away from the center, middle of the space, we do get a weak coupling description for which even if you break supersymmetry, you can say something. So we can say something about the potential for the large phi values. And it turns out it always exponentially falls off in all the examples we know of. Or they are exactly zero or they exponentially fall off for large values of phi. In other words, we find if you're interested in positive potential, you find that the potential for large values of phi goes like e to the minus a constant times phi for some constant phi. Now, in, so people have looked at various examples, different kinds of examples with different shapes of the six dimensional compact space with different fluxes in it, different, different fields in it. And you find that the potential always goes exponentially down, but uh, they found that this, the slope actually cannot be very flat either. Namely the slope V prime dV d phi over V is always bigger than or equal to square root of two thirds if you measure it in Planck units. So there seems to be some universal bound about how flat you can get the potential compared to the potential itself. Okay. So now I come back to what, do, what can we say about the, what can we say about the, um, the model of the dark energy? Well, there cannot be any model of dark energy which is stable in string theory. So why is that? Well, if you have a situation like this where the energy is positive at some minimum here, as I told you, if you go far enough in field space, it goes to zero. Therefore, no matter how small the lambda you pick here, there's going to be far away, far enough away, there's a lower energy state and it will decay to a tunnel to that place. So therefore any, any positive energy configuration in string theory is ultimately unstable. At best it's metastable like the one I'm drawing here. 
So therefore we make a prediction that our universe is unstable and it's gonna decay away. Of course, it's natural to ask if we are in one of these universes with this energy here positive, how long, is, how long do we have? And that's a question I will address momentarily, but this seems to be therefore a, without any hard work, we are already making a prediction, a, I think a remarkable prediction that our universe is, cannot be stable. That's gonna to have to decay. Now, uh, one of the constraints that we, we know at large field values seems to be, and this is what's called the Sitter Swampland constraint, that the slope of the potential far away in the field space is always bigger than a constant times V. That's what I was just mentioning before, where in four dimensions C is given by square root of two thirds. The question is, do we know any restrictions inside, not very far away, but inside this, this field space? Now, before I get to that, let me mention why this is very natural, this kind of relation. You see, this is deeply related to this duality conjecture or the distance conjecture I was telling you about. If you go far in the field space, I told you that you typically get a tower of masses where the mass goes exponentially with phi, e to the minus some constant times phi. Well, if you compute the contribution of these particles to the potential, they typically go like m to the fourth. So therefore you get something which goes like potential, which goes like e to the minus four a phi. So in other words, it goes like some other constant times phi. So the fact that you get exponential uh, potentials is related to the fact that the tower of particles also exponential in mass with respect to these parameters. Okay, so that's good. Now, what can we say about the inside? About the inside, we don't have anything terribly reliable to say. The reason is these are strongly coupled points. These are the points where weak coupling approaches of string theory do not apply. These are the regions for which we don't have a perturbative description. And since we have broken supersymmetry, we don't have any analytic techniques to say anything about inside. For supersymmetric theories, where the potential vanishes identically on this whole space, we can say something about this, but now we cannot say anything because we have broken supersymmetry. So what can we say about the behavior of the potential inside? Well, there are three possibilities considered so far for what happens for V inside this field space. One is that there is no restriction. There are no restrictions inside could be anything. Well, this is unnatural. Why is that unnatural? Well, because we know that the boundary of this potential should always be exponential. So it's not arbitrary, it has some structure. So to say that inside is arbitrary sounds a little bizarre. So I don't think the one is natural. So instead, some proposals have been made over what can happen inside. And these proposals are the following. One proposal is called the Dissiter Swampland Conjecture, which says that this condition V prime is always bigger than V appears to be still true inside, except that it is a possibility that if it gets violated, it's only violated by unstable situations. That is, you could have a situation where V prime is actually zero, like the top of this potential, but is unsufficiently unstable. That is the V double prime over V is sufficiently negative. So therefore you don't get a metastable meta dissenter in this way, but unstable dissenter. There's another conjecture, which is the trans con censorship conjecture. This conjecture says that um, if you have, it sounds like completely unrelated to V at first sight, it just says the following. If you have an expanding universe, if you consider a tiny fluctuation inside the Planck scale, smaller than the Planck scale, and if the universe evolves, this, this fluctuation evolves, it can never grow bigger than the size of the universe, the Hubble scale. So this is called the trans Planckian censorship conjecture that sub Planckian modes, modes which are smaller than the Planck length, do not grow to be bigger than the universe because then they will freeze out. And it'd be bizarre to expect that sub Planckian modes become frozen because sub Planckian modes we don't think are physical objects because scales below Planck are not believed to be physical the space itself is not going to be a smooth structure under smaller than Planck scale. So we expect these modes not to make sense physically in terms of geometry. And therefore we don't expect them to freeze out in our, so it's kind of, it will be in your face kind of, if they freeze out in front of you, it's a non-physical mode, so it doesn't make much sense. So this is the motivation for this conjecture. 
So if the universe starts with the radius A initial and grows to A final, the, the Planck length, uh, the fluctuation of length Planck gets, gets magnified by this factor of AF over AI. And we wanna say that this length is less than the Hubble horizon at the end, which is one over H, H is the Hubble constant divided at the final value of it. So this naively has nothing to do with the V, but then you can say, okay, let me consider potential, but insist that this, this never gets violated. What you find that this condition alone explains the asymptotic behavior that has been observed in string examples. That is you find just because of this condition, you can derive now that V prime over V is bigger than or equal to the square root of two thirds. So we now have an analytic explanation of the square root of two thirds from a simple looking principle here. Now this principle does allow the sitter, but metastable the sitter. So this third one allows a, a universe which looks a little like our universe, a metastable the sitter. But it turns out that the de-sitter spaces that it derives is very unstable, a very, a very short lifetime. So in other words, uh, as I will review momentarily. But before doing it, but before talking about that, let me go back to early universe first. So consider the swampland conjectures and inflation. So one of the successful models for the early universe has been inflation. It turns out inflation seems to be in, in a bit of a conflict with swampland principles. The, the duality conjectures leads to the prediction that we cannot have a naturally large arbitrary field range. So in inflation, you, have, you, you typically look for a relatively large flat potential for a large field range. Now, it doesn't have to be infinitely large, but it's relatively large. And you might expect that you get a tower of light state emerging. And so this, this, this is a little bit of a tension, though one could try to alleviate some of this tension by considering the multi-dimensional field. So there's some, some leeway in, in terms of accommodating it. But in addition, the fact that V prime is bigger than V and uh, with the sum slope of order one, seems to be a little bit of a problem with inflation because in plateau models, for example, the simplest class of examples in inflation, you find that that slope of the potential is that should be less than 0 0.02, which seems much less than order one. So at least it's somewhat in conflict with order one. So anyhow, this still looks a little bit in, in tension within, with these swampland conditions. And if you take the transplanking censorship conjecture I was telling you about, it turns out that it leads to inflation models with potential energy scales, which is very small compared to what you typically take in inflation models, like 10 to the 14 or 15 GeV. This is 10 to the 9 GeV. And this leads to the uh, epsilon, the slow roll parameter of inflation to be 10 to the minus, less than 10 to the minus 31. And the R parameter, which is give, gives you the strength of the tensor modes to be 10 to the minus 30. So it's very, very minuscule. And more than that, you find that the theory should be highly fine-tuned to give inflation. So therefore, I would say that in general, if you believe these conjecture for the swampland, inflation is in trouble. So you might ask if inflation is in trouble, then how are you gonna resolve the early universe puzzles? You see, the puzzles of early universe arise after, after one makes one major assumption. And that major assumption is at odds with the string dualities. For example, take the, take the horizon problem. We take the universe, we take the universe back to the early time, the radius shrinks to zero. And we say, oh, therefore what happens is that the, the light coming from the left and the light coming from the right had never been in causal contact. And there's a horizon problem. And if you assume that you're pushing back the universe all the way back, they will never be in causal contact when you take the Friedman Robertson Walker model. So you have to do something to it. So that's already, one of the problems and inflation tries to solve this by saying, no, they were in contact. It was an inflation. They took it, they magnified the space and then the FRLW starts. So therefore they were in contact because there was an original inflation model. However, string theory duality cast doubt on this assumption. The assumption is that when you take the radius going to zero, you're assuming that your effective theory is still valid. The effective theory should break down, string theory says. String theory is making a prediction that you need new modes. Inflation is good if you're not looking for any amazingly tower of light states or anything like that emerging, but string theory is expecting it. So therefore this very much strongly suggests that the early universe should be described by dual theory, not art theory. So our description for the early universe should break down. 
So having a complete effective theory, which is valid for early time and late times as a simple package is not a virtue, is actually something against string dualities. String dualities typically expect you to find new degrees of freedom and therefore a dual description. <laughs> for example, as the radius goes to zero, you expect the temperature to go up to infinity at early time. Temperature in Euclidean space can be viewed as the radius related to radius, inverse radius of a Euclidean radius, Euclidean time with the inverse, inverse temperature radius. And temperature going to infinity is again related to that radius going to zero. Again, you have to have a tower of light states. So both the temperature going to infinity and the radius going to zero is telling you there must be a dual description. So there has been proposal for what these dual descriptions are based on string ideas, but I won't be able to have a time to talk about them here. One of them is called, for example, the string gas cosmology and more recent one in the past, past few months, we have proposed another one based on the fact that early universe could be replaced by a topological phase of the universe, a topological gravity originally suggested by Witten in four dimensions. So the early universe will kind of be scale invariant. Instead of you blowing the whole space to, to, to accommodate symmetry, the whole, topo the whole theory is topological at the early phase. So let me talk about the present and the future in the context of Swampland. If we assume that this is their Swampland conjecture, we can only be rolling in the potential situation where you have a potential. And since it's a potential and it's rolling for a while, you're going to go for a while. And after a while, you're going to move in the field space by a large distance. But when you go to a large distance, you get light tower of states, as I mentioned before. So therefore you get to a new, you get a phase transition. And the estimated time for this phase transition, we have done based on fitting the cosmological observation with the, with the theoretical models we have, it leads to the, uh, the lifetime of this phase transition uh, happening of, uh, of the time scale of the about 30 times the Hubble time. If we assume instead trans Planckian censorship conjecture, it can be either this scenario as we just said, rolling situation or a short-lived metastable desitter. It turns out that the lifetime of the sitter is the Hubble time times the log of one over the Hubble, Hubble. So in other words, the lifetime we get, instead of being the Hubble time is magnified by the log of one over the square root of the cosmological constant, which gives you this factor about two trillion years. So we are expecting an upper lifetime in our universe of the order of a couple trillion years. Either of the de Sitter conjectures explain one version of the coincidence problem of why the time scale associated to measured value of the dark energy, namely one over square root of lambda is close to the current age of the universe. In other words, why does the current age, why does this coincide with one over root lambda? They're two independent things. Well, that's a coincidence problem. Well, the lifetime of the universe, it turns out according to these Sitter conjectures cannot be much longer. Once you measure the dark energy, once the dark energy is a sizable fraction of the universe, then you're close to the end of that universe because that's a more or less the same time scale as the whole lifetime of that whole universe. So therefore, in any universe you measure the dark energy, you have essentially, that is essentially heralds the beginning of the end for that universe. So the, the fact that the dark energy in our universe was measured in a couple of decades ago is also from this perspective, the beginning of the news that our, our universe is going to end not too far in the future. Too far, of course, means trillion years, perhaps in our case. <clears throat> okay, so let me conclude. Swampland conditions can lead to potentially observable consequences for particle physics and cosmology. Almost all quantum field theories are in the swampland and therefore fine tuning such as hierarchy problem that people deal with in the context of particle physics may end up having a completely different solution when you take into account quantum gravity. Quantum gravity brings new things to the table that are mysterious from the viewpoint of quantum field theory. It puts severe restrictions on consistent quantum gravity theories. These ideas suggest restrictions on light matter fields and moreover the positive energy in the context of quantum gravity lead to local and global instabilities that I discussed. And this may also explain the coincidence problem. New ideas, such as dualities that I was mentioning, are expected to play a key role for early universe. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, let's see, some people may have questions. I hope you can unmute yourselves and speak. 
maybe um, Ed Davis can unmute everybody and everybody can speak. Well, in the absence of a question, let me um, ask another one. Uh, Paul Steinhardt has proposed um, bouncing universes. Um, what do you think of that as an alternative to uh, inflation? I think that the, the main issue about the early universe is that, as I was mentioning, string theory predicts a dual description, not a continuation of the gravity. In other words, the description naively should break down. So I think that what used to be before string theory, it was a virtue to have a complete quantum field theory. Yeah. So you find one action which describes everything. We have learned that that's not a virtue. That's a deficiency of the theory. That's that, the fact that you have dual descriptions is a key feature that is not a, it's not to be avoided. It's actually to be welcomed. So we should not say that we have one theory describing the whole region of field space. That mentality of inflation or bouncing universe is still in the same mode of mindset that we want one action to describe the whole universe. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, you, your statement that the uh, neutrino mass was related to the cosmological constant. Yes. Would you say that's a prediction that's, that given the cosmological constant, the neutrino mass can't be zero? Uh, they, th that is, so, so I haven't said that it is related. I said it may be related, uh, but some, some physicists in a different paper that I didn't talk about, uh, in a different work that I didn't talk about, uh, we have concluded that uh, based on some other arguments that it's hard to review here, that indeed, if you compactify string theory on a, on a circle, if the mass of the de Sitter was not of the order of lambda to one quarter, you get some problems with quantum gravity. So indeed, therefore, I would say that we have some indirect arguments that the mass of neutrino cannot be smaller of order one times lambda to the one quarter. And people have tried to make that order one number more precise. So yes, mass of the neutrino cannot be zero. Hi, I, got, I have a question. Thanks a lot, Cameron, for this um, great colloquium. Thank you. Um, could you. Could you comment a little bit on, on dark matter? You thought, I mean, we spent a bunch of time talking about dark energy. Yes. Um, does some of these conjecture make a statement about the fact that dark matter is you know, five times as abundant as normal matter? It doesn't, it doesn't say anything specific about dark matter. It just says dark, dark matter can exist with no problem in the context of the swampland idea. So there's, there's no problem with that. There's another thing that is related to the uh, dark matter, which I can explain uh, in the following way. So typically, as I said, we compactify the space to get down to our four dimensions. And you can ask, okay, how do we get our gauge particles? How do we get our matter? Where do they arise? It is a fact about standard model that is basically made of very few particles, relatively speaking, and gauge forces. And it's asymptotically free, at least if you just look at the matter content that we have seen. So if you look at that, then you ask, okay, how could this fit in string theory? You find that the only way that, the, the, the only way that kind of setup can arise is that if it comes from a tiny part of this internal compact space. So you have a compact space with a tiny part of it giving our, our, our universe, our dark matter, I mean. So therefore there's a rest of the whole thing is left over. All that whole man, even though it's compact and so to speak tiny, all these other possible excitations in that will not be accounted for or that tiny little corner. So, so it's natural in that context to say that if you have a theory which is asymptotically free, there must be dark matter. So in that sense, you would say it predicts a dark matter, but this is a bit heuristic, so I'd rather not make this strong statement, but I would say it's natural that that's the case. In fact, we contemplated the swampland conjecture, which is the following, which is not quite right, but I will just tell you the gist of it. The gist of it is that if you start with a quantum field theory, which is asymptotically free, then it cannot be part of the landscape. That is, there must be a reason for it to, to have to be coupled to gravity. Gravity should fix a problem. The problem is that it's not by itself consistent. Where a standard model and so on by itself looks consistent, you don't need anything else. You don't need a gravity. Well, the gravity says, I'm, what am I here for, so to speak? So, so in some sense, that it seems like there's this other thing that says, no, there must be other stuff. And that in this case will be the dark matter. Okay, great, thanks. Look. Can you ask a question? Yes. 
Thank you very much for um, the excellent talk. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. So my question is more of a, I'd say, philosophical question. So um, we know that we have a very successful standard model and um, QED and QCD, and it predicts pretty much everything uh, uh, that we observe to many, many digits. Um, my question is, this whole thing, this whole system is very successful within the quantization of fields and so on and so forth. Is it possible, just as more of a philosophical question, that we don't even need to quantize gravity? And it would. Does every field that exists in nature have to be quantized? Or yes, can it just have be talked about this. That if, you, if you assume quantum mechanics is there, you will have to quantize gravity. And people have talked about it. You get inconsistencies. You cannot treat classical gravity and quantum other fields. Dynamically, if you treat gravity as dynamic. So there's no avoidance of this issue. But I would I say see. that we shouldn't, but let me add a sentence, which is, you said something about the fact that there are these nice quantum quantized particles and all that. Those same nice features arise in string theory. So you also have these quantum particles and all that as part of the spectrum of strings. So it's nothing like you don't lose it. It's not like, okay, by putting the string in there, you're losing all that. No, no, no. It's perfectly fine. You have these particles, and in addition, you have a quantum graviton. So that's the beauty of it. You don't have any problem. No, no, I'm not, I'm not question, questioning at all the beauty and machinery of uh, quantum yeah. gravity and, and, and the string theory. And I know that you get plenty and, and maybe more for that. My, my question was, uh, and can you point me where you think would be the biggest consistencies that you would encounter if you have a quantized um, uh, field theory coupled to um, a background. What would, you, what, what, what would even your framework be, for example? What would you even mean by that? Just, for example, you have a Feynman path integral. That corresponds to the principle where you integrate over all fields. If you don't integrate over metric, then you don't have any equation for Einstein. The only reason we get Einstein's equation is variation of the metric. And the only way we can get this in the Feynman pattern was that if you put metric in the action and integrate. So therefore, you don't, I don't even, cannot even contemplate what would it mean to have a classical gravity with a non-classical non uh, matter. Thank you. You're welcome. What do you recommend as um, the best uh, introduction to string theory? Well, there are different uh, books, depends on different levels. For undergraduate, there's a book that Barton Zwieback has written. Yes. Which is a very nice nice book, actually, even though it's for undergraduate, it really gets to the core of many interesting things. And then there are more advanced books. Uh, Green Shorts and Witten wrote a book 30, 40 years ago or so. And that's already good, classic, but then there are more modern versions of that by Polchinski. And then there are more advanced, more uh, other books which try to capture what has happened the past 10, 20 years by uh, Beckers and Schwartz, as well as Kritzis. So these are some of the books that are in the, yeah, yeah. In, the in the era. Let's see, maybe another person would like to ask a question. All right, let me ask another stupid question. Um, somehow I, I picture the uh, bouncing universe uh, model of um, Steinhardt and Aegis. Um, I imagine that the universe goes through cycles where it just um, gets a lot smaller and bounces without becoming singular. Would, would that be okay? That might avoid the necessity of having such a very different description of the singularity because there really isn't one? Well, let me explain the way that something, something like that happens in string theory, which, has, which, was already, which predates these bouncing models, which is called the string gas cosmology. So let me explain what happens there. You start with the universe. It is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And when it shrinks too much, that description breaks down. But if you continued with that description, you find the radius co continues to get smaller and smaller. However, the better description is that when it gets smaller than Planck scale, the dual description is better described by a circle which is growing. The dual description, not the original description. So in other words, you get the dual description for which the radius is expanding. 
So therefore, it's not the same space that's expanding. The original space continues to shrink forever, but that becomes a bad description. You have to shift over to a new description, which is growing. So you could call this bounce, but it's not really a bounce in the sense that the universe shrinks and that universe continues to shrink, but it's a bad description. The correct description is now it's growing. And so that's the duality. So that's the beauty of duality. The duality of string theory allows you to an effective bounce without, without the kind of bounce that's a single field. In other words, it's not within the same space. The dual space grows. This is one of those. So I, I'm trying to point out that so what, so let me explain a little more what happens. So if you take a space which gets become small, you get these winding strings which come light. And those winding strings which come light define a new space. If you use these winding strings, you get a new space. And in terms of that new space, the space is actually expands then. Not, it's not contracting, even though you think it's contracting in terms of original space, in terms of this winding strings expanding. It's quite beautiful, actually. In other words, it's something that theorists could not have imagined. It just, it just came out of the theory. It was too beautiful to have been guessed at. So I would call this a duality bounce, not a bounce. That was that model was described in my paper in the 1980s with Brandenberger. It's called string gas cosmology. You've you've um, given us so many ideas that um, it's um, hard, at least for me, to to um, even. Um, think about all the things you've suggested um, and talked about. Um, uh, it was certainly a wonderful talk, a wonderful colloquium. Um, Thanks. I don't, I don't think I should keep you any longer um, in as much as I'm the only one asking questions at this point. Um, uh, let, let me ask one further one, though. You mentioned books. Uh, what about just articles? Aren't, or, or I guess string theory is too, too big a subject to be described in an actual article. Uh, well, there are there are some articles. I mean, um, let's see. What's the best way to? Um, I can let you think. Yeah, there's, there's actually, I did write a, write a, uh, like just like four or five page article for, uh, for, uh, for physics publication. Let me just try to see if I can access it here so I can share it. Just one second. Um, I don't think it's here, but um, who wrote it? I wrote it. Oh, you wrote it? Yes, I wrote this. I wrote basically the general ideas of swampland about what, what it is that uh, and basically uh, trying to explain it from the. Did you write it? We can use Inspire to find it, probably. Exactly, exactly. That's that's the better way of doing it. So if you, exactly. So if you do, uh, if you the Inspire, then you will find this. I'll put it in the chat right now. Actually, if I just. Uh, um, let me just see if I can get it. Um, let's see here. Well, yeah, this is the this is the article. I'll just put it in the so chat. What year was it? I just put it just a few years ago. This is a short article. I just put it on the chat. Oh, okay. So maybe a, a follow-up question on Kevin's, um, if that's okay. Um, where do you see the impact of string theory most prominent on other fields of physics um, showing up? And what, what what is your take on that? And, and where, where do you take pleasure to see how it's impacted other areas of physics? Well, string theory has impacted many areas. So it depends on what is your what, is, what kind of area you're interested in asking. For example, for certainly it's impacted mathematics. That's number one. If you ask about areas in physics, I would say it has begun to impact many areas also in physics. Quantum field theories 
has been much better understood thanks to string theory. We have discovered new quantum systems in five and six dimensions, which we didn't know existed, which have nothing to do with gauge theories. We have learned um, beautiful facts about supersymmetric theories that are simple pictures of string theory already motivated with not much computation, which in quantum field theory correspond to very highly non-trivial, non-perturbative calculations. Then more other ones is that uh, in the context of holography, we have learned quite an interesting set of interesting connections between that and condensed matter physics that people have been pursuing. For example, quantum information theory questions have been per being pursued in the context of holography and uh, quantum entanglement and all that is, is a new direction that people are pursuing in relation to black holes. So there are all these different things coming up. So there depends on which kind of area you're saying. There are perhaps too many, actually. I wish it was somehow more manageable. It's, it's beyond, beyond any particular one person to have complete understanding of all of what's happening in all string theory right now. Thank you. Um, uh, one area may I suggest is because my area is optics. Um, certainly uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanics of um, uh, the original work of Witten and, and so on and so forth has, is being applied now to design optical structures. I see, very good. <laughs> yeah, supersymmetry is a cool stuff in every field. <laughs> I know that. Um, let's see, L let me ask again another question related to one, to this business of the, of the, um, the landscape and the possible quantum field theories. You, you said um, you could have a supersymmetric Yang Mills, N equals four Yang Mills, um, as long as um, the uh, gauge group wasn't too big. Um, yeah. um, is that the only quantum field theory that's consistent with gravity or is that just one example? And if it's one example, what are the others like? The n, for n equals to four, if you take four, the n equals to four, four dimensional it's by a gauge group, but you can have lower n. You can have n equals to three, n equals to two, n equals to one, n equals to zero. I was just talking about n equals to four because the possibilities are much more restricted, namely with the higher the supersymmetry, the more restrictive the theory is. Oh. So for n equals to four supersymmetry, once you specify the gauge symmetry, you are fixed, you're done. If you have n equals to two, you have to have the same matter, you have to say this and that. If you have n equals to one, you have to say the interactions, the Yukawas, all that. So there's, there's more information. So I was just trying to give the simplest theory with the highest amount of supersymmetry. So the n equals to four is such that once you say this n equal to four supersymmetry, all you can specify is a gauge symmetry and that's it. You're, you're, you have defined the theory completely. So that's why I just talked about the gauge symmetry. So there's a whole raft then of supersymmetric quantum field theories that as long as they're gauge theories um, may be compatible with quantum gravity. Some of them, some of them, but none, as I said, most of them are not. Most supersymmetric theories are inconsistent just because n equals to four is wasn't one example that most of them were inconsistent. The same thing applies with n equals to two, n equals to one supersymmetry, no supersymmetry. Most, most quantum field theories you might think about are inconsistent with quantum gravity. I see. I try to use the simplest one to explain, to, to make a point. Right, right. And I think you listed seven criteria back there. That was, yes. so the, the, if the theory satisfies all those criteria, it's consistent, is that right? No, no. You see, you have, a, you have, a, you have an infinite space and you wanna get islands. Suppose I told you that you have an infinite, you have a, you have, just as, as an example, suppose your space is R2, two dimensional plane. And suppose there are just seven points on it, which are good. And yeah. I want to tell you what are the good points. I either tell you exact coordinates, or if I don't tell you, if I just tell you, well, all these seven points are the, to the left of this line. All of these seven points are to the right of this other line. All of these seven points, are, these are the conditions the way we are drawing. We're drawing these lines. I see. Saying these are, but I'm not specifying, if it's to the right of this line, that's not good enough. After all, there are only seven points out of this infinitely many possibilities. So to try to specify exactly what that theory is, it's gonna be very difficult. How do I define the seven points other than giving exact coordinates? So does that mean there are only a finite number of? Yes, finite number of consistent quantum field theories if you couple to gravity. 
Wow, I didn't realize that. But so, that fine yeah. number could be big. I, I don't want to mislead you too much. In other yeah, words, that's right. there are... we tend to the sum power, but it's finite. Yes, Compared yes. to infinity, any finite number is measure zero. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay. Well, um, you've been very generous to give us the colloquium and to answer so many questions. Um, uh, and um, so let's, let's thank you again. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure giving a talk and I enjoyed discussing uh, with you and also your questions. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you post COVID when everything is back to normal and keep safe till then. Well, that would be wonderful. So, um, just a personal touch. Uh, <laughs> Um, some 25 years ago, when I was a first year grad student, now I'm a law professor at UNM, I um, wrote you an email and asked you some questions. Um, you were very generous. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, glad yes. that, I'm glad that you mentioned this. Your memory is better than mine, but thank you very much for telling me. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> I you. just thank wanted you. to um, appreciate how generous you were. So. Thank you, and uh, I'm glad that you made it there. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.